Hey everybody, let's learn something new today with Mr. Mosley, the music teacher. Red Bird Sings The Story of Zitkala Sa Native American author, musician, and activist. Adapted by Gina Capaldi and Q. L. Pierce. Illustrations by Gina Capaldi. The Atlantic Monthly, 1900. The day I lost my spirit, 1884. I remember the day I lost my spirit. It was not the day that the missionaries came to our Indian village to take me and my friends to their Eastern boarding school. Nor was it the night that we reached the school grounds where my body trembled more from fear than from the snow I trod upon. It was late the next morning when my friend Judwin overheard talk of cutting our long, heavy hair. No, I will not submit. I will struggle first. I said. I crept up the stairs as quietly as I could in my new squeaking shoes. I found a large room with three white beds and crawled under the one in the darkest corner. Loud voices called my name, and women entered the room. I watched them open closet doors and peep behind large trunks. Someone threw up the curtains, and the room filled with light. I remember being dragged out, kicking and scratching. They carried me down the stairs and tied me fast in a chair. I cried and shook my head wildly until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck. Then my keepers gnawed off my thick braids and cut my hair in a shingled style that labeled me as a coward. I lost my spirit that day. I could not know that it would rise again, stronger and wiser for the wounds it had suffered. Great Shadows, 1883. The seeds of my journey were sown in an earlier season when I was a wild girl 
of seven. Free as the wind and no less spirited than a bounding deer. My overflowing spirit was my mother's pride. She taught me to have no fear save for intruding upon others. Our teepee stood at the base of some hills. A footpath wound its way through long swamp grasses to the edge of the Missouri River. Many a summer afternoon, a party of four or five of my playmates roamed over the hills with me. We delighted in impersonating our mothers. I remember how we used to exchange our necklaces, beaded belts, and sometimes even our moccasins. We pretended to offer them as gifts to one another. In the lap of the prairie we sat and told stories of heroic deeds performed by relatives and exclaimed, Han, Han! Yes, yes! When we grew tired of our games or stories, we always returned to chasing the great shadows that played among the hills. The Iron Horse, February 1884. The first turning away from the easy natural flow of my life occurred in early spring. It was in the month of February of my eighth year. My older brother, Dawi, had returned from three years of education in the East. From my playmates, I heard that two pale-faced missionaries from the land of red apples were in our village. They were from that class of white men who wore big hats and carried large hearts. When they came to our house, an interpreter who knew a smattering of my language joined them. Mother, ask them if little girls may have all the red apples they want when they go east, I whispered. The interpreter heard me. Yes, little girl, and you will have a ride on the iron horse if you go with these good people. Mother, say yes, I pleaded before I went to bed. I begged the great spirit to make my mother allow me to go with the missionaries. The next morning, my brother came for her decision. Dawi, tell the missionaries they may take my little daughter. She will need an education when she is grown. I was happy. Soon, I was being drawn away by the white man's horses. But when I looked back and watched the lonely figure of my mother vanish in the distance, 
a sense of regret settled upon me. The land of red apples. The days that followed 1884. There were eight in our party of bronze children who were going east with the missionaries. We were three young braves, two tall girls, and three small ones. Judy Wing, Thaw Wing, and me. On the train, fair women with tottering babies scrutinized us. Large men with heavy bundles in their hands stared. Children hung themselves upon the backs of seats and pointed at our moccasins and blankets. I sank deep into the corner of my seat, eyes downcast. We traveled 700 miles to reach White's Manual Labor Institute in Wabash, Indiana. What I remembered best of that ride were the sweetmeats or candies that were tossed out by our keepers. It was night when we reached the school grounds and were led toward an open door. The noisy hurrying of hard shoes upon a bare wooden floor wearing in my ears frightened me and I began to cry. The Anglos could not understand the cause of my tears and placed me at a table loaded with food. Because of my sobs, I could swallow very little that evening. I was tucked into bed with one of the tall girls. She talked to me in my mother's tongue and soothed me. Many events would follow, which would force me to be brave in a cold, unknown world. The routine, 1884 through 1887. We had a routine during our first three years at White's. A loud bell would awaken us at half past six in the morning. We had a short time to jump into our shoes and clothes and wet our eyes with icy water before a small bell rang. Bounding down the stairs to the assembly room, we were met by a pale Anglo woman with a roll book and pencil in hand. She looked over the rim of her spectacles at each of us as we answered here to the calling of our names. Each day we marched off to breakfast and said prayers from a religion different from our own. We practiced our vocational training Girls were shown how to be housekeepers. 
We sewed clothes and scrubbed the floors. Boys were trained to be farmers. They tended livestock and repaired fences. Then came our schooling. I loved learning how to read and write. They even taught us how to speak well in public. I appeared to have a talent for such things. After dinner, we heard lectures against drinking and gambling. The Quakers told us about the slavery that had existed in our country not so long ago. They talked about equal rights and how women were not given the same opportunities as men. They stressed tolerance for all people and the importance of fighting against injustice. I listened carefully. Saturdays meant music lessons. My wounded spirit soared like a bird as I practiced the piano and the violin. Four Strange Summers February 1887 through February 1891 Once I had been at White's for three years. I realized that the Quakers there were well-meaning, but blind to the true needs of the Indian children. They could not see the harm of taking the young from their families and stripping them of their language and traditions. I could no longer tolerate my own losses and was allowed to visit home. During this visit, I seemed to hang in the heart of chaos because I was caught between two worlds. Even nature seemed to have no place for me. I was neither a small girl nor a tall one neither a wild Indian nor a tame one. Everything had changed. My mother had moved from her teepee to a home made of logs. But living in a building of the white man's style could not help her to understand what it was like to be in a schoolhouse, to learn to read and write and want more of it. My brother Dawi, being almost 10 years my senior, could not understand my feelings of loneliness. One moonlit night, I cried when I heard Dawi and his friends as they passed by our cottage. They were no longer boys with blankets and eagle plumes, nor Indian maids with prettily painted cheeks. They had gone to school in the East and had become civilized. The young men wore the white man's trousers and coats with bright neckties. The girls wore muslin dresses. During these gatherings, they talked English. I could speak English as well as Dawi. 
but I had no hat, no ribbons, or no close fitting gowns. I remain loyal to the Yankton ways, yet no longer belonged. Continuing at White Manual Labor Institute. February 1891 and into 1895. At 15, I finally buried the sadness I felt when I first left my mother as a wee child of eight. Books, music, and writing now comforted me. I realized that to have more, I must make my way further into the Anglo world. Against my mother's wishes, I followed my own heart and placed myself into the Quaker's hands at White's Institute once more. This time, I had a plan, and it was not to become a housekeeper. I love to learn and was a good student. And I particularly love the study of music. I had become so accomplished on the violin and the piano that when the music teacher resigned, I was allowed to take her position. In 1895, I was proud to be presented with my first diploma. During our commencement ceremonies, we recited poetry, sang, and gave speeches. I spoke of the inequality of women. The local newspapers reported that my speech was a masterpiece that has never been surpassed in eloquence or literary perfection of any girl in this country. Earlham College, September 1895. My mother saw that my cousins and others my age were returning home, having completed their education. When my education at White's Institute was complete, she wanted me home as well. But I wanted a different sort of life, one filled with the books, the writing, and the music I had grown to love. For these, I chose to disobey my mother's wishes. In the months after I graduated, instead of returning home, I remained near Whites in Wabash, Indiana and gave music lessons to local Anglo children. In September, I began my career as a freshman at Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, just 100 miles from White's Institute. Though my schooling was funded by generous Quakers, I had worries. I found myself heavy hearted as I began my life among strangers whose hearts seemed cold. I often wept in secret, 
thinking I had made the wrong choice and wishing I had returned home to be nourished by my mother's love. But I felt that if I persevered, I would soon discover my true gifts and talents. At Earlham, I entered an oratorical contest. The classes assembled in the chapel. One after another, I heard each of the contestants speak and then receive a polite burst of applause. Too soon my turn came, and I paused a moment behind the curtains for a deep breath. My speech, side by side, was on women's suffrage and rights, subjects I had learned to care so much about at White's. After concluding my words, I heard much applause and the judges awarded me first place. There was a mad uproar. My classmates sang and shouted my name. They handed me a large bouquet of roses and gave a party to celebrate my victory. I believed then that I had made the right choice. The State Contest, February 1896 through 1897. A few weeks afterward, I appeared as Earl Ham's representative in a statewide oratorical contest. To be true to my heart and to my pride as an Indian, I chose to rewrite my speech and address the mistreatment of my people. I sat nervously awaiting my turn knowing I was going to be the last to speak. Being the only woman among men and the only American Indian among Anglos, my opponent's outbursts and slurs against women and the Indian burned like a fever at my breast. Some of them threw out a large white flag with the drawing of an Indian girl labeled with the word squaw, printed in bold black letters. My teeth were hard set as I watched the white flag float in the air. My turn came and I spoke for the allotted 10 minutes, touching upon the peopling of the earth and the slow growth of civilization in America, a nation of free people and free institutions. Most importantly, I spoke of the noble Indian and urged my audience to accept us as equals. There were two prizes given that night, and one of them was mine. The spirit laughed within me when the white flag was dropped out of sight, and the arms that unfurled it hung limp in defeat. At Earlham, I joined music glee clubs, sang, played my piano and violin at recitals, and wrote articles and poems for the school newspaper. I collected legends of my people, translated them to Latin, 
and rewrote them in English for children. I was thriving. But six weeks before school ended, I became so ill that I had to withdraw in order to recuperate off campus. Because of my poor health, I was forced to leave Earlham without earning my degree. Red Bird Takes Wing July 1897 through 1900 Since my days of my childhood, I had been traveling slowly toward the morning horizon. If given the opportunity, I wish to serve as a representative of my people and as an example of what could be accomplished. I accepted an invitation to teach at Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania. There I met Richard Henry Pratt. Aha! So you are the little Indian girl who created the excitement among the college orators, he said. I was anxious to showcase my talents and Pratt was anxious to see them. Within my first year at Carlisle, I blossomed. I conducted debates on the treatment of American Indians and gave lectures and dramatic readings. I taught the children music and soon became the leader of the girls' glee club and the pianist for the chapel services. At Carlisle, I was known as the girl violinist of its traveling band. We performed with our hearts and soul and took our packed houses by storm. We had the great fortune to play music at the White House and I read The Famine from Longfellow's poem, Hiawatha, for President McKinley. When much applause brought me to the stage for a second bow, they presented me with a bouquet of English violets, a moment I will forever cherish. I had kept my culture in my heart, and now I began to write about it. My stories appeared in the Atlantic Monthly in January, February, and March of 1900. I was now known as Zikala Sa, Red Bird. Literary societies heartily approved of my work and the American public was awakened by it. I was encouraged by this and knew that I had many more stories to tell. Planted in a strange earth 1900 through 1901. On one early morning, I was summoned to Pratt's office at Carlisle. He was sending me west to gather Indian pupils for the school. It had been six years since I had been home. 
as I neared my homeland, I gazed upon the countryside from the train window. The cloud shadows that drifted on the waving yellow of long dried grasses thrilled me like the meeting of old friends. On the reservation, my heart ached when I found my mother's log house in disrepair. The sod roof was trying to spawn tiny sunflowers from the seeds which had been planted by the constant wind. That night, I learned the fate of my brother, Dawi. He had not been able to make use of the education from the Eastern school. So he had taken to the plow to feed his wife and two children. I also learned that Anglo settlers had come to live on land promised to our people. An anger surged within me. I found no way to cool my inflamed feelings. I seemed to be planted in a strange earth that was littered with broken promises to my people for the white man's books I had given up my faith in the great spirit for these same books I had forgotten the healing of trees and brooks I had let a distance grow between my mother's simple life and my own and so I had lost her as well. When I returned to Carlisle in the fall, I prayed to the Great Spirit for direction and a new plan emerged. I became more determined than ever to excel among the Anglos by establishing myself as a musician. I knew that more must be done to improve my talents in order to grow. So I resigned my post at the school to move to Boston in search of creative freedom. For a while, I studied music and voice at the New England Conservatory of Music. But my time in Boston was not long lived. Yankton called my family's poverty and my mother's advancing years haunted me. With a book contract in hand, I went home in 1901 to write the legends of my youth. The Sundance, 1902 through 1916. My music and literary gifts helped to enlighten Anglo society to the story of my people. My talents were tools that supported my greater goals. Once I returned home, I married a Yankton Dakota man, Raymond Bonin. Together, 
we traveled to Utah and worked among the Ute people. I felt great joy at the birth of my son, Ohaya. While I dedicated my life to the Native American cause, the sweet sounds of music sprang from my soul. In 1913, with my colleague, William F. Hansen, I wrote and staged the first opera co-authored by a Native American. I played Sioux melodies on the violin and William transcribed them into Western notes. Our opera had in its heart a Sioux ritual, the Sun Dance. Members of the Ute Nation perform the dance in all its splendor and it opened to excellent reviews. The Atlantic Monthly 1917 through 1938 The true course of my life remained. My husband and I were drawn to Washington, D.C. so that we could speak for the rights of the American Indian in the place where policies were made. We quickly learned the game of politics and began to rectify injustices. We sought the right for Native Americans to vote and saw the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924. In 1926, we created the National Council of American Indians to continue to fight for rights and equality. We sought improved education and health care for our people and saw President Hoover appoint two Indian Rights Association representatives to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Mine has been a life of change and with it, adjustments. This change gave me the freedom to move in two worlds while never forgetting who I was. As President Lincoln once stated, I must stand with anybody that stands right. Stand with him while he is right and part with him when he goes wrong. I shall always continue my path as a writer of causes and purposes. A voice for my people. For in my heart lives that wild girl of seven, free as the wind and no less spirited than a bounding deer ever chasing the great shadows that play among the hills of my home. Have a nice day, everybody. See you next time with Mr. Mosley, the music teacher.